Have you been disheartened or confused by the way that COVID-19 will affect our future green meetings and sustainable events? I was said to my friends, I thought we were reverting to the days before green initiatives. But that was until I sat down with Natalie Lowe and Candice Telserum of the Sustainable Events Forum. They have changed the way that I view green meetings and I want you to hear this full length video. Stick around. Hey friends, it's Leanne and when COVID-19 hit, venues almost immediately reverted back to using single use items to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Great health and safety protocol on their part, right? But for us green meetings people, it meant that we were going back to single use plastics, which is what we were trying to avoid in the first place. And I was really disheartened to see all these practices and all this good work go to waste. That was until I decided to connect with Natalie and Candace over at the Sustainable Events Forum. And I was going to interview them for, what, five or ten minutes about a quick checklist item that they could give to event planners about how to continue making their events sustainable. Well, what happened next was unknown to me and created this amazing opportunity that I could now pass on to you. 40 minutes of gold and insight from the founders of the Sustainable Events Forum about how to view green meetings and, of course, how to partner with your venues on continuing to create green meetings and sustainable events. I cannot wait for you to hear their insights. It will change the way you view green meetings. Candace and Natalie also kindly shared a checklist with me that you can use when communicating with your venue. You can find it over at www.conferencesource.net forward slash sustainable events. Again, that's www.conferencesource.net forward slash sustainable events. Before we get to the interview, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on that little bell to be notified of new videos. We're creating content each and every week for our meeting planner and meeting supplier friends, and I don't want you to miss a thing. And so without further ado, Natalie Lowe and Candice Tulsiarum with the Sustainable Events Forum. Enjoy. Hey everyone, it's Leanne. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm joined today by two of my favorite event professionals in the meetings industry. Today I'm joined by the co-founders of the Sustainable Events Forum, Candice Tulsiarum and Natalie Lowe. Thank you both for joining us today. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks Thank for inviting you. us, Leanne. Nice to be here. Yeah, no problem. So glad to have you here. And there's a compelling reason why I wanted to chat with you ladies today. When COVID-19 hit, we started to see a lot of shifts in how people responded to sustainable initiatives and green practices. And as founders of the Sustainable Events Forum, you're obviously seeing this, and I'd love to dive into what we're seeing out there, and especially what your advice is for not only event professionals, but just for us as we're going through this time. Uh, so if you're comfortable, I'm just going to launch into a few questions that I've had on my mind about sustainability, and hoping that I can get some insights for you, and insights that we can share to the meetings community. And one of the things we're really seeing is the return of single use items, which is something the industry worked <laughs> so hard to eradicate when it came to our meetings and conferences. What can you share about this return to single use items? Absolutely. Candice, you want to you wanna take uh, that sure. one first? Um, I'll dive in. I mean, it is an unfortunate side effect of this pandemic that we're seeing mm -hmm. right now. It's um, basically, there's a huge pro single use plastic agenda that's happening as we've seen and heard on the news and all the blogs that we've been reading. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of overshadowed all the progress that we've made as an industry mm -hmm. to move away from those plastics. Um, but I think what we need to remember is that we really need to vet the information that we're reading and rely on the science behind why plastics are not good for the environment. So let's not bring back the plastic water bottles and the straws um, and the plastic cutlery. It wasn't good for the environment before the pandemic, and it's definitely not good even after this. So, you know, Natalie and I, um, we interviewed the plastics manager from Environmental Defense this week, and she, she said something really interesting, as I'm sure most of you have read, that the latest studies have actually shown that plastic survives up to two to three days longer on plastic, on, sorry, the virus survives up to two to three days longer on plastics versus something like cardboard. 
So with that fact alone, um, it's been vetted by the medical industry. Why are we pushing to use plastics at our uh, or having it at our event again, right? It's not the safer option. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I just want to add in there, I mean, y- you know, doing what we do, obviously the plastic water bottles were the first things to really be targeted. And one of the things that when we were talking to Ashley was that you, when you touch that plastic piece, unless it says sterile and it's in a medical or a laboratory condition, it's not sterile. You don't know who touched that before it got to you. And it mm-hmm. kind of reminds me, do you remember a few years ago when we found out that those airplane blankets maybe weren't as clean as we thought they were yeah or when they started to do the germ scans and we realized you know where we should be careful in hotel rooms and where we shouldn't and so we've created this false equivalency where we think oh if it's wrapped in plastic it must be cleaner than if it went through that industrial dishwasher and so one of the things that I would ask people to think about is where do you want to drink your water from that plastic bottle that's been touched all the way from the plant to the loading dock to the service table that you're picking it up from? Or do you want to use that, that glassware that's been through an industrial dishwasher at you know, however many degrees out of a tap or, or out of a dispenser that would have no human contact? And so we, we fall prey to sort of these false equivalencies, plastic wrapped equals sterile safe yeah and i think we're gonna have to rely on our industry partners you know our venues our convention centers um, our food and beverage partners and trust that they are implementing new processes and policies to sanitize um, and and really um, think about the hygiene aspects you know they may have been doing a good job before but i bet you post event event world they are going to be ramping up those initiatives so we really need to trust that our partners are doing the right thing um, and looking after the health of you and your attendees when you book um, space at their venues or convention centers i I appreciate that but i'm going to repeat a very old latin term caveat emptor i think at the end of the day you are going to have to ask the right questions you really are like Mm -hmm. i i wish it was easier i wish we could just say okay let's just assume but you well, know, maybe you, it's you, a check. It's, it's part of your checklist absolutely. now in planning your events, right? Um, where before you checked, oh, Wi-Fi connection's great, you know, you know accessibility, et cetera. It's now going to be on your checklist as a planner, I think, the health and safety aspects. You know, are they certified in certain health codes now yeah. post-COVID? So planners now have to have to add that to their list of questions when they're doing site visits and sending out RFPs, there's, there's now going to be a huge chunk in their RFPs around sustainability practices, green initiatives, and also health and safety. Well, and I think one of the things that we need to be aware of is that food is not considered an overly high risk area. It's more surfaces, right? And, um, you know, I had asked um, for Canadians, there was a great documentary show on CBC Gem, um, and it talks about, I can't remember the name of it, but it talks talks about if your house is ready for COVID. And they looked at how to properly clean things. And they said, like, we're using all of these fancy things. Um, They went through with a a microbiologist and said, at the end of the day, you want to use soap and water, or you want to use bleach and water. They said not even to combine the bleach with the soap, and that that would kill the virus. And so it's not so much what you're putting into your mouth, because we know that our digestive tract kills the virus. It's what we touch and then, right? So it's the door handles, the bathroom, the, and I don't think we need to plastic wrap those. I'm just. Yeah. Well, how, how do you plastic wrap them for each and every use? Um, And to your point, we're seeing a lot of hotels come out with their new cleanliness practices. In fact, I feel like it's all I've done this week is receive that information (laughs) and put it in a nice package for my clients to use when planning their events. But you're right, the the brand standards, getting back to Candace's point and yours as well, Natalie, about planners still being responsible for those things, those practices are coming from a brand level. Um, And so until we can see each property create and document their own practices um, separate from a brand level practice, the planners are gonna have to do their checks and balances each and every time. Yeah, and maybe we're going to get to that point in an industry where it's standardized. 
right, where it's not just up to that brand, hotel, venue. It's just a standard in our industry because mm-hmm. I hate to be the Debbie Downer here, but this uh, we will have another pandemic, right, whether it's in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So setting those standards now and let's learn from what we're going through now is super important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why you ladies are here today is I'm hopeful that after today and already you've given planners so much to think about that they're in a position now to uh, create more accountability on their own part um, for their events. Um, So on that note, I'd love to ask you another question that I have um, because it is right now about the, the safety camp versus the sustainability camp and how the two can come together. And as planners, we want a cohesive message between those two camps. What advice do you have for planners when creating either a communication strategy or a logistic strategy around both sustainability and safety? Right, right. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to stop separating health and safety from the environment. And and I think in many ways we've sort of learned that, right? We understand now that there's a direct correlation to the severity of the disease in populations with the level of air pollution. And so, you know, Candace and I kind of like to say green is clean, right? There's nothing dirty about soap Mm -hmm. and water and it's great Mm -hmm. for the environment, right? You use that soap and water and, and you're good. I think, you know, we have been overly focused on the health sort of area and the economic area. And what we need to understand is within that Venn diagram, we have to include the environment. And that, you know, access to clean water and, um, and interestingly enough, one of the best things that you can do is ensure that the workforce in your destination is well paid and has healthcare benefits. Right? And, and the, you know, it goes back to part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is that we're starting to see that through COVID-19 is that mm-hmm. this is going to be in some ways the great equalizer because you can't expect a resort or a hotel to be clean and well run and, and functioning properly if the staff is, is, is not healthy and happy. And so mm-hmm. I think we need to sort of start to balance some of those systems. I think in a lot of cases, um, the, the environment can really help with the economy, right? Nobody wants to go to a dirty destination. That's not what, mm-hmm. what's on our wish list. We want those mm-hmm. beautiful areas. And so that really needs to be included in, in sort of part of what we're doing. I think the other thing is that we need to recognize that our individual actions are great, but they're a gateway drug. We Stopping the use of straws or, or plastic coverings is such a tiny part of it. With the entire country or the entire world, the planet on lockdown, we've only reduced emissions by 5%. And people would say, well, why is that? Because look at how our electricity is generated, right? So if yeah. you go to a destination that has wind or solar energy versus a destination that's burning coal. So right now, even though the world's on lockdown, we're still at 95% of emissions. We've still got carbon in the air because we're all using our laptops and turning on our lights. So one of the things that we need to start doing is systems thinking, right? And that is, you'll hear the term circular economy. And uh, Candace, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the circular economy and how that affects us as planners. So a circular economy um, perspective really takes into account one hello to the puppy dog. Yeah. <laughs> <He's coming. laughs> um, really takes into account the life cycle of the products that we use. So for example, your grandmother or our grandparents would have had a seed, they would have planted the seed, they would have eaten the vegetable, they would have canned or frozen or somehow processed the leftovers, and then the next year they would have reused the seeds from that original crop. So it's a cradle to cradle is what they call it right? So there's no waste built into the system. We, especially in the events industry, we're a throwaway culture, Mm -hmm. right? We use it, we toss it out, we go on to the next event. So we are going to have to start thinking in those systems. And that's where the environmental systems will start to become part of our health and safety will start to become part of our economics. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, that, Can, yeah there's a lot, a lot of great information in there. Leanne's head, <laughs> I can see your head spinning, Leanne. 
<laughs> well, what it's done now, it's, um, you're right. I mean, everything obviously you've said is right. And that's why you needed to deliver this message and not someone like me as, as a, uh, an advocate we're, for the we're going to convert you though <laughs> yeah well it's but it it's a lot it's a lot to process for a planner and mm -hmm. so for the planners listening to to this recording and they they are on board they are on mm -hmm. team Absolutely. natalie and candace but Absolutely. but what are some very tactical things they can do to start moving the needle towards that systems way of thinking I, I, I think not, yeah. obviously it's overwhelming to hear all that information, right? But being realistic about your goals is the first thing and setting, Natalie, you mentioned the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of those goals. We're not saying that everyone needs to go out and check the box and say that you've mm -hmm. met all of those criteria. No, it's, it's, it's impossible, right? Yeah. Um, choose three for your next major event. And to me, the easiest one as a planner when choosing to go the sustainability route is aligning with destinations, as Natalie mentioned, that are clean um, and really aligning with the correct venues that have already all the uh, policies and procedures in place. You know, they're LEED certified, they're Green mm -hmm. Key um, mm -hmm. certified. Mm -hmm. Look at those venues. That's an easy win by going with a venue that's already on board with sustainability. You've already checked mm -hmm. a lot off that list. Uh, you know? Absolutely. And what I want to, you should be a little overwhelmed. What we're about to go into is going to be overwhelming. It's going to be that way for a little while until we gain expertise in thinking this way. And so what you're seeing is a bit of a shift in the marketplace where responsibility for some of that skill set rested with the destination and with the hotel. And what we're going to be seeing is a sharing of that responsibility. A more, a more balanced approach, really. And so it was interesting. I belong to the Sustainable Events Alliance, and they did this um, uh, hackathon. And during the hackathon, I learned from some of the people that worked on the EIC green guidelines. They sent out a big survey and said, why aren't more people doing green? And all the planners came back and said, we wish the suppliers would be offering us green options. We mm -hmm. just don't see that yep. we're offered a lot of green mm -hmm. options. And all the supplier or all the suppliers came back and said, we really wish, wish the they planners had. would ask us. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so we got this chicken and egg. And yes. so what we have to do is we have to say, okay, stop the chicken, stop the egg. You have to look at the whole enchilada, which has nothing to do with eggs, but there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to start saying, okay, let's take a broader view of where our events fit into a business plan or a business um, you know, purpose at a broader scale. And so we need to step back and say, okay, how are we going to accomplish that? What are the values that are going to sort of drive that forward? And if you bring it back, Candace is absolutely right. You're not going to be able to do it all, but every day your awareness is going to grow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's just being aware that there's a bigger picture out there, being aware that how the electricity is generated is actually the biggest source. And, you know, when we mm -hmm. did the sustainable events farm, we were very lucky to work with Robert Thompson and his team, and they did everything off the grid with solar generators but they had never done it before because nobody had ever asked them to. Right. Ask. Right. Ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also I think part that what goes hand in hand with asking is when you find out, share information. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times um, people have all this great knowledge about suppliers that are doing great things, whether they're producing, are they upcycling and reusing old banners and signage and billboards. Mm -hmm. Well, who are those people? I want to align with them and work with them. Right. So mm -hmm. share your list, your, your supplier list. I wish we had almost a directory in our industry of those eco-friendly suppliers. And maybe it's something we can build out together as an industry to, to share information. And let's, let's show our industry that we do care, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's part of how we should be doing business. That's but in fairness, I know sometimes I blow Candace's brain because I want to go big. Uh, we will give you a couple of quick and easy things. First thing, when we talked to the plastics expert, Ashley, and we said, talk to us about greenwashing. She said, do you want an example of greenwashing? Biodegradable and compostable plastics. So you're being sold the dream, but servicing it is a nightmare, right? It's an old okay. hospitality term. So what happens is, when you see this great compostable plastic, the problem is how your plastics are recycled 
happens at the municipal level. So what Canvas is talking about is almost a two-fold system. One, we have to understand the products, but not every municipality or jurisdiction can handle waste in the same way. So yeah, you might management. go you might go to you know toronto great no problem they compost all over the place but if you're in another city they may not have the capability and so all that hard work and and good effort sort of goes to waste and it's one of the things that canvas and i are working on is sort of helping people define it is climate action and climate you know sort of sustainable action is really really local it does not happen yeah. on a global scale. It is tiny little things. And the, the other thing that I thought that was really interesting that she talked to us about was she actually said plastic bottles were the easiest thing to sure. recycle. Mm -hmm. But she told us that little recycling okay. symbol on the bottom, the loop, um, doesn't mean it's recyclable. It means it could be, not that it will be. It's the number said, inside the loop. And Leanne is totally going, whoa. So yeah. there's a number so inside that we're recycling. <laughs> it's one yeah. or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's recyclable or not. So I'm willing to bet a lot of our industry folks don't even know when they toss something in the garbage, they're assuming, yeah, I've done my part. Woohoo, I'm a good human. I've recycled something, but that does not necessarily mean it's going to be recycled. It may end either be incinerated or end up in a landfill. So it's, it's again so now, man, that knowledge, right? That education that's required. So now you understand why I'm so adamant that we think about that whole system. Because again, you do all that work. You know, you source the biodegradable, you get it all lined up, but you don't have the system at the other side of it to actually process it. Yeah. Right? So it's just like a salesperson who oversells and then operations is left to kind of figure out how to do it. How right? to deliver, yeah. So, so I apologize, but then I need to get back to what you think a planner, even what a planner's first few questions should be when moving into a venue. And now again, keeping in COVID guidelines, what, what should a few of their very first questions be to the venue? Ask to see their sustainability plan. Yeah. They'll show okay. you right now, they're going to okay. be handing you their COVID cleanliness plan and just ask where, where's your sustainability okay. plan along with it? Yeah, again, okay. it goes back to asking those questions when you start the conversation, right? And engagement, mm -hmm. pre-planning, that should be first and foremost on your RFPs when you do your site visits. Some of them will take you behind the scenes. I know we did our event at the Hilton Meadowvale and uh, the GM um, took our guests after the event uh, for a behind the scenes operational look at how things are done. So they're not just tooting their horn and saying, we're a four green, green key certified property. Come, let's show you how we do it. So perhaps from a planner perspective, it's during your site visits, not being shy about asking to see how that's done. And okay. it's going to, I bet you it's going to open up uh, a door of just amazing questions that you may not have thought about from a site selection mm -hmm. perspective, right? Yeah, no, so. very fair. Now, Leanne, is, do do both planners and suppliers watch your, your video blog? They do, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> then for suppliers, what I would say is start offering things and start taking, you know, we're going to be forced to live our values a little bit, and, and that's what's showing. So if a company is valuing the profit over the planet, they're going to give you those cheaper alternatives if mm -hmm. they're going to put the planet as a priority so as a supplier i simply tell people no we don't offer that option it's it's just not on the menu yeah, yeah. and, and you know it's, a, it's akin to a planners having a conversation with clients let's say yeah. um and saying to your clients so here's what we don't do at our events you know with with my company 360 events if i'm doing um if i'm having a, a prospecting client discovery meeting, I will say to them, well, here's what I don't do at my events. So single use mm -hmm. plastics, I really don't support it. And here's why. And it might be that they never even thought about that. They're like, oh, well, you know, just a small meeting. Yeah. No, but it's something you should. So you're almost planting the seed when you're talking to your clients. Now, whether or not they end up doing business with me or not, I've now started that conversation and I've made them maybe think about their next meeting not mm -hmm. having single use plastics and asking about green policies at the venues that they go to and with their suppliers. So it's just having the conversation. 
Well, and what concerns me is that those stakeholders, our clients, whoever it is that we're creating these events for, my concern is that they will move away from the sustainability conversation because they have to focus so much on the safety and the health conversation. So women like you are able to marry the two and ensure that planners are thinking about both. Um, but that's what other planners need to feel empowered to do as well, is that they're not singular conversations, that they do go hand in hand with one another, and that the yeah. sustainability conversation is continuing, um, even though we've been, we've been, I guess, challenged with other considerations, the sustainability conversation is still happening, and it needs to continue to happen. Yeah, it's well, interesting because, sorry, not. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to say information is power. And the mm. biggest frustration that I have with planners who are friends or clients is that they don't ask enough questions sometimes about, well, what, it, what does that mean? Or what do you mean? And, and it's twofold. One is it might have just escaped their notice, right? There are so many details that you have as a planner. Mm. Or sometimes um, they, you know, they, they just don't have time. And mm -hmm. so it, what I would say is that if you are planning your event, the, the, number the number one best thing that you can do is make sure that you get the best sustainability information that you can for your destination. So that would be, you know, skip over it because the UK has incredible information on sustainability that doesn't apply here in North America. And then you will start to see those correlations between the, the COVID guidelines that are coming out mm -hmm. and the sustainability guidelines. And that's mm -hmm. where we start to see, you know, issues like the, you know, the plastic wrapping where you can just start to challenge it. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. just going to add that prior to this pandemic in the late, you know, 20, in late 2019 and early 2020, we've all attended these conferences where at least one of their panels on the agenda was about sustainability and meeting trends of the future. And when we mentioned meeting trends of the future, sustainability came up as the number one trend and that was just mm -hmm. November of last year so I just I really urge planners to not forget that that mm -hmm. just you know a few months ago we were all on board the sustainability train so once this pandemic is behind us my hope is that it remains important in the minds of planners and we've done a really good job as an industry recognizing that we need to make change and we need to move that needle um, and I think our attendees are now, are now coming to our events expecting sustainability to be one of the core or pillars of our event and um, if you are not on board with that then that's just not you're not doing good business in my mm -hmm. book so but I understand what you mean Leanne about sort of combining them I have nurses in my family and and they do default like they'll throw it out before they'll clean it <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and you know it's it's sort of that that mindset of well, just in case. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a larger part of this is that there's an expense to throwing those things out. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we are going to struggle with. It's that educating ourselves. There is so much information out there. But the reality is that as we degrade our environment, it's actually harder to keep things clean. It's not mm -hmm. easier. Right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and that's a big picture thought. Um, but when you're talking to stakeholders, what I've found is that information is power. I have, I've never had a client come back to me and say, we don't want that sustainable option. You know, okay. we're more comfortable with this, but you've got to know your facts. And that's mm -hmm. why, you know, talking to the local, you know, sustainable people or finding a resource that, that sort of digs into that local will help you balance those two, um, those two issues. I, I sense that is the recurring message and the recurring advice for planners is start local, talk to your venue, talk to the venue's municipality, uh, get yourself as knowledgeable as you can about those practices in place and ask questions at that micro level uh, rather than looking at the, the art larger enchilada as you yeah. put it <laughs> yes. Okay. yes and we'll we'll help you we've got all kinds of resources on the questions to ask um and what you'll find is the municipalities around the world are in fact in canada almost every municipality has a um a climate change coordinator because yeah. as these structural changes come down it's actually the cities and the towns that are really being affected 
right? It's roads, it's sewers, right? Things that we don't think about. Flash flooding in your destination, right? Think about the issues that we've had in Calgary and Montreal, across Canada, Kelowna, your, your forest fires, right? And so those are very municipally located. And so the Canadian Federation of Municipalities grant, gave grants to all the, of the cities and towns and they, they have uh, climate change coordinators. Incredible source of, of knowledge. Okay. Okay. So let's get these planners to tap into <laughs> those resources. Um, so ladies, I have one, uh, well, two final questions for you, and then I will um, leave you. This one might be a little bit controversial, but now that we're not meeting and everything <laughs> is done virtually, um, you may have alluded to this already because um, you mentioned that our emissions aren't down that much, but is, is us doing all these Zoom meetings, is this, is this helping the, the environment by staying away from the larger conventions at this time? I, I, I definitely think it has. Um, if anything, I think our pandemic that we're going through right now, it's been a bit of a catalyst in developing our understanding of how to produce virtual events. And no one is going to say it's going to replace face to face. That's never going to happen, right? We're human. We crave that connection. We crave that sense of community, which is sometimes mm -hmm. why we go to events, right? Mm -hmm. So I think as an industry, we are learning a lot and we're seeing an evolution. Um, they're, they're referring to this as a great pause, and that's what it is. The earth hasn't magically cleansed and healed itself, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're beyond that point right now, but mm -hmm. the great pause is meant to sure let it breathe, but it should also be a realization for planners and, and our suppliers and partners that we know how to do better, and now we should be doing better. Mm -hmm. So I think I see the future of, of our industry um, where virtual events, hybrid events actually, are now going to be huge part of our people's business models um, and their planning for events. And I think we will come back stronger as an industry, as we always do, but the focus is going to be really heavy on attendee health and mm -hmm. sustainability. And like we've been saying throughout this conversation, those two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So the utilizing okay. what we've learned yeah. through the pandemic is key. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to disagree. Um, I, 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 you know, all of the Zoom meetings, I, and I, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to agree and disagree because I think it's great that we're doing these Zoom meetings. Um, I think we do miss having that personal connection, but the reality is we haven't dropped emissions enough. And that is because mm -hmm. what we do personally and at our meetings, um, Candice and I never started the TSEF thinking that we were going to create a solution to climate change. What we're really trying to do is we, we want to be your climate junkies, really. Like we, or we want to be your climate dealers, right? It's a gateway action because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if we do not have systemic change, the world is not on a good path, path right. right? So right. think of it this way. If you're on a diet and you eat one healthy meal and then you gorge all evening before dinner or, or after dinner, <laughs> you're not doing so right yeah. now we have to understand that our systems the way that they're put together our food system 58 percent of the food in canada is wasted so that means it was the the field was plowed it was planted it was harvested it was shipped for not to go mm -hmm. into a landfill somewhere so <sighs> You know, our, our entry level is food waste. Fifty eight percent of food in Canada is wasted. Right. So we've got to attack food waste. And what people don't understand is that not every municipality can compost. So it's going into the garbage. Even in municipalities, I've had wineries here in Niagara who for years have been throwing their garbage in, or their food waste into the garbage. Huge volumes. When yeah. food waste goes into the landfill, it creates methane. If it goes into the compost, those nutrients can be regenerated. So we go back again to that circular economy, to that right. systems thinking. And I know yeah. everyone's going to say, ah, oh, my head hurts. But unfortunately, it's calculus time yeah. in high school, mm -hmm. you know, like we're going yeah. to have. So we know that, you know, our food system, our energy system, and our materials systems need massive overhaul. And mm -hmm. what Candace and I have always said is that event planners sit in this unique, amazing spot where we can influence hundreds of people at a time by the choices mm -hmm. that we make at our events. And so yeah. that's what I want people to be thinking about is how can I show a better way? Right? Yeah. We've all come back from a conference and said, hey, I saw this great new thing or I tried this cool new thing. And 
we need to use social norming in order to claw back. We, we are at a point now where we've got irrepar irreparable harm to, mm -hmm. to the earth. That's yeah. just where we're at. But it, you know, yeah. while you are taking the great pause and I'm taking the great pause and Leanne is taking the great pause, the people that are deforesting the Amazon have taken no pause. Yeah, and we have to remember yeah. that. I'm glad you um, mentioned food, Natalie, because I think going back to previous comments Leanne made about the easy wins that planners can take, the yeah. food part of it is one of those easy wins. And what I think obviously post COVID buffets may be a thing of the past and let's face it, buffets were the source at large conferences, many events for food waste. So mm -hmm. in a way, it's a bit of a silver lining, I think, where we're now doing away with those buffets and now it's individual portions, box lunches, you know, yeah. and there's a bit less waste, but we need to remember but, asking but again, again the question, composting you know, or not. I don't understand this thing about buffets and I mean, it, food is not sort of one of their high, but you know, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's again where I think we need to be really careful. There is so much information out there that's just wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to check your sources. You have to be careful about what you um, about what you believe. And, you know, there are some great climate scientists. And I think, you know, let's talk about Planet of the Humans for a minute, right? There is this amazing um, filmmaker who has this reputation for um, accountability and fact checking. And he put out a movie that is just not true, right? He's using old data. Seven million people apparently have watched this movie and now believe that green energy is not efficient. Well, he's using stats from 20 years ago, right? Which, which movie is that? It's The Planet of the Humans by Michael Moore. Yeah, so my, my husband watched that, so I can't wait to tell him this. <laughs> I, I kind of listened in from the kitchen yeah. while he was watching it, but that's, that's very interesting to hear you as a sustainable um, advocate say that um, it's there's some inaccuracies in that, in that particular well, and, product. So. And I thought it was a really interesting perspective. You know, you kind of go into it with an open mind. Um, you know, I think many of us have enjoyed his films in the past and you go into it with an open mind and some of the things, so I have a science background. So I, you know, when it comes to sustainability, being a nerd kind of helps me. Right. And we went and looked at this test that he used where he was, um, charging a, uh, a cellular phone using some solar panels. And I looked at that and I'm like, nobody's used that in like years, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you know, and, and so you look at and you say, well, what does that actually mean if you delve into the map? And actually Environmental Defense did a fantastic webinar um, and they had a, a green energy specialist from Australia come in and he was explaining the math behind how you get the efficiencies. And you just think if everyone could have a solar panel on their house that charged their car, I mean, that's the Tesla model, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? You know, I mean, I would love to plug my car into my solar panel on the side of my house and never have to. And, and we have to understand that for years, there are people who have huge business interests who don't want this change. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Simon yeah. Sinek did a fantastic video that's actually out and I'll send you the link to it. He talked about accepting change and moving towards change. And he made the, the comment, he said, Uber didn't put the taxi companies out of business. The taxi companies refused to change. So as planners, we can look at this and go, how much change can we do? Those of us who are adaptable, right? Darwin yeah. never said it was survival of the fittest. He said it was survival of the adaptable. So mm -hmm. let's embrace that change mm -hmm. and go for it. There's my so dread. <laughs> no, you know what? That is such a great way to wrap up this chat because you are right. The, the planners that you're seeing still moving forward are the ones who are adapting and changing. And whether that's changing their events to virtual or whatever that product is for them and they're, they're creating something new out of the chaos. So I 100% am on board with that. I, I love that <laughs> philosophy. And so uh, to wrap you up, can, I would like to, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You can see we play good cop, bad cop. Yes. Yeah, this is always the good cop. <laughs> hey, listen, that, but then you get all perspectives, right? And, and, and to your point, even going back to the movie, 
that's one perspective. But the great yeah. thing about the partnership that you guys have created is, is you bring a number of different filters to the table. And, and that's such a great benefit to the industry. And so to wrap up, I'd love to know how are the two of you moving forward and adapting at this time? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I've been at home with uh, two toddlers, two rambunctious toddlers. So when I'm not chasing them around the house, Natalie and I have really sort of put our heads down and we really want to continue sharing as much information as we can. Um, we were slated to have an event in Toronto in June, which is obviously now not happening live. Um, and we, and yes, I'm going to say the word, we have pivoted to <laughs> <laughs> putting our brains together and we have such great conversations and sometimes we wish we recorded them for other people to hear. So now we have uh, decided to launch our podcast. Uh, we will be launching a podcast in June. It's called Planners for the Planet. Um, and we are busy right now interviewing some amazing people doing yeah. some great things in sustainability from different sectors. As Natalie mentioned, it's great to talk to others outside of our industry so that we gain new perspectives that we can then share with our listeners and readers. So that's what we're busy doing right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't know how Candice does it. Um, actually, Candice and I were part of, um, I hosted the Earth Day um, celebration that we did for CanSpec. We had so much fun doing it. Um, we, we had panels of suppliers and planners discussing some of these issues sort of in a post-COVID world. And um, we're going to do it again. Um, Meeting Planners International is, is going to be hosting a webinar on sustainability that that we'll be doing. And, and so it has really taken on a virtual aspect. Um, and I think, you know, Candice is correct. It is the great pause. It might not be the pause for the environment, but it is the pause for us. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I really, really believe is we can choose to live our values going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think there were times when we sacrificed our values for the sake of business. And, and I, I think we're all rethinking that. And you can see it in our political activism right now, in our support of frontline workers. You know, I, I hear people saying, I don't wanna support X, Y, Z because their workers aren't being taken care of. I never heard people say that before. Mm. And so I think, you know, we're at home more, we're starting to see, everybody's talking about, oh, I have no idea how much recycling I'm doing. And so we're starting to pay attention to those things. And mm. if, if we're going to have the great reopening after the great pause, we know as business women that in order for us to achieve something, we're going to sit down and plan it out. So mm -hmm. we, say, mm -hmm. we want a safe, healthy, prosperous, sustainable future. We'll get it. If we don't put that into the plan, it won't happen. Well, and I think that's why all of us need to start doing this work now, because it's going to take some time to get that ready um, for when we do reopen. So um, let's get to work. And I am so <laughs> excited about the podcast. Um, so thank you both um, for joining me today and uh, sharing your thoughts about, about what it is that you guys do so well in such a strange and uncertain time. And so friends, watch for the planner, Planners for the Planet <laughs> podcast. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> planners for the Planet podcast. It is coming out in June um, with these beautiful hosts, Natalie and Candace of the Sustainable Events Forum. Ladies, thank you so much for your time and I will see you over on the podcast. And that thanks sounds great. Okay, thanks again. Bye. Bye.